Surprise Egg Learn a Word. Having fun with arts and crafts. B. U. T. Surprise! Surprise! Disney Frozen! Shake, shake, shake! Disney Frozen! Fun figurines? Whoa! Marshmallow! <laughs> and now, a spelling celebration! for cracking us up. Bye-bye. It's Baby Big Mouth. Subscribe for surprises. Surprise. It's a surprise party with colorful ooze. So let's see what putty colors we have and see what color wins. Ready? Purple.
design era is the arts and crafts era. This era spans from about the 1860s to the early 1900s. Uh, so it overlaps with much of the Victorian era uh, that we previously looked at and was very much a reaction to Victorian design elements that we saw then. Uh, they were reacting to what they called the impoverished state of the decorative arts. Um, they emphasized traditional craftsmanship over mechanized and commercial aspects of Victorian design. Ironically, this was a movement that saw a great deal of consumer uh, and commercial success. That's how these things tend to go. Uh, on the European side of this movement were a couple of standout ind individuals. The first is John Ruskin. He was a staunch critic of the Victorian era. 
he wrote about politics and economics, natural science, art, and other lots of other topics. Um, he was a very much a cross-genre kind of guy. He probably would have made a very good IDS major. Um, he was one of the first to write about what we would now call environmentalism. Uh, sustainability and the importance of human craft were uh, common topics for him in his writing. Um, in his art, uh, Ruskin's main works revolved around utilizing the handcrafted look and themes of the medieval era um, in Europe. Uh, he saw it as a no nobler age than the one that he found himself in. Um, like I said, he was a critic of, of his times. Uh, he used a great deal of ornate and, and painstaking detail in his works, um, trying to evoke that feeling of the pre-mechanized world. The other prominent British designer of this era would be uh, William Morris. Um, and again, he was a writer and artist and did quite a bit of work with uh, textile design, actually. Uh, again, he used more natural elements, trying to work against the mechanization in the, of art and design that he saw happening in the Industrial Revolution um, in the Victorian era. In the United States, the giant standout individual in the craft, arts and crafts movement is Frank Lloyd Wright. He was most famous for his architectural works and inter interior design. Uh, we have many, many fine examples of his work right here in the Midwest. Um, I'm actually from up by Mason City in Iowa, and we have a number of homes and, and commercial buildings there that are still in active use uh, that were designed by Frank Lloyd Wright and his uh, designers. Um, Many, many homes and, and, and buildings like this exist uh, throughout the, the, the Midwest and, and the East. Uh, this is one of his stained glass windows. It's called the Tree of Light, of uh, Tree of Life, rather. Um, it uses natural themes, um, but it does it in a more geometric display than what we saw with Ruskin uh, and, and so forth before. It's, it's an attempt to combine the aesthetic of nature with the mathematical engineering of human endeavors. So it's kind of, it, Frank Lloyd Wright was really big on trying to say, hey, you know, nature is very important. I want to have nature in all of my work, but I also want to be able to combine that with, um, with, with the, the human, you know, straight lines and angles and things like that. Um, so it was a, it was an interesting play between the two. Um, you know, this, this creates you know a very striking uh, display, and it, and it looks interesting and and even somewhat contemporary, even you know nearly a century later. Uh, this is the Johnson Wax headquarters in Racine, Wisconsin. Again, we see the hand of nature here. You know, you have you have to have columns to hold up the ceiling. Um, so you know why not evoke things like giant mushrooms or trees or something like that and have the the light filtering through stained glass so it's sort of like uh filtering through the leaves uh you know in, in a in a forest canopy you know why be plain when you can make an office look interesting i wish more offices were built like this uh, i would very much prefer to work in something that was kind of cool looking than that than you know all the boring cubicles i've spent most of my adult life in uh, Frank Lloyd Wright did a lot with furniture as well. Um, we actually have many examples of this style um, at, on the UNI campus. Uh, in Lang, there's some excellent examples and, and many of the, of the other buildings as well. Uh, one of Frank Lloyd Wright's most famous uh, houses is one called Falling Water. Um, and it really does seem to grow from its environment. You know, even though it's these very, you know, straight lines and right angles and so forth, it fits within that spot. It feels natural. It feels as if it could have grown from that spot. Um, there's actually a stream that you see in the picture that actually flows through part of the, you know, underneath part of the house. Um, it's just a fascinating, uh, fascinating uh, building and, and wonderfully well executed. Um, there is a video that I have um, embedded in this section on e-learning. Uh, there's also a link here. Um, this is done by uh, Cristobal Villa. I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but um, it shows how it's an animation that he did, and it shows how falling falling water is integrated into its environment, and you can see, you know, how it's supposed to sort of 
grow from that environment by you know having computer animation actually make it grow uh, from that environment. So please watch that video after you are completed, uh, after you've completed watching this uh, video lecture.